My name is Diane Slegel, and I currently work at Caterpillar. I'm a global IT analyst at Caterpillar. However, as Hans mentioned, prior to this, I did work at a prison, so I'm used to a captive audience. <laughs> so my hope is that the next 25 minutes doesn't seem like 25 years for you. If it does, flag or something, or just walk out. I guess that's the alternative. So Caterpillar was founded more than 85 years ago, if you aren't familiar with our company. You maybe have seen us, but maybe not made the connection with exactly what it is that we do. <clears throat> We're the world's leading manufacturer of construction and mining equipment, diesel and natural gas engines, gas turbines, and diesel electric lo locomotives. That's all I'm going to read to you. That's it. No more. Um, we have more than 115,000 employees worldwide. We also maintain the identities for agencies, supplier, customers, dealers, joint venture, and a myriad of other different uh, affiliations within Caterpillar. So what you'll know is that we are a big company and our changes affect a lot of people. So we have to be very careful with our change management. Some of the things that Hans just mentioned about scalability, we are at that point where it's not going to be easy now. I, I did a certificate change a couple of, um, a year and a half ago, and it wasn't too painful. But we're at a point now where that ex certificate exchange is going to be very, very painful. So we're, we're at that cusp right now where we are just big enough to be um, needing to look at maybe some other solutions or some other alternatives. Oops. So why change management and why should you care about it? The jingle I like to think of when I think of my current job is, this is not your father's Oldsmobile. When I took the job two years ago, we put in about 10 connections a year. Pardon me, I took the job four years ago. We put in eight to 10 connections a year. I did a lot of other support issues, that sort of thing. We, in the last two years, the last year and a half, have increased our number of connections by 175%. So it isn't the same job that it was two years ago. This is a full-time position at this point. We have implemented a new software version and an upgrade in the last year. We are working on OAuth and OpenID Connect for um, both internal and external. We are looking very carefully at what we need to do with mobile devices. We need to balance our security issues and the access that we need, so we're looking at implementing the next 509 certificate check. Again, this was something that was talked about in one of the presentations earlier. We also are implementing a Windows authentication uh, module as well, so it amounted to 10, 10 servers. And if you're used to being involved in a big company, what you know is that 10 servers isn't something you snap, snap your fingers and you're able to get them. So we have 10 servers, we have the load balancers, the firewall rules, the proxies, all that stuff that goes in front of it. So these are fairly large initiatives, at least in, in a corporation our, our size. And then, of course, we are trying to manage all these corporate-wide security initiatives because single sign-on, we kind of lose sight of this sometimes. We think, oh, well, it just makes password maintenance easier. And that's one facet of it, but there's a lot more to it than that. And, um, actually, the more important parts are the security initiatives. So unlike the dog in the picture, my plate is full. We have two, essentially two different kinds of single sign-on requests. One, are those, one is the one that comes from individual single sign-on requests from third-party vendors or business partners. And the second one are, is the one that is our corporate-wide SSO. The very first thing to keep in mind then is that we need to re determine our requirements early. And this involves involving the right people in these discussions. Typically we have a meeting that lasts for about an hour. And in this meeting we have those stakeholders who are going to talk at this high level of what single sign-on means to their business. And then they're going to hand it off to somebody, a tech person. And then the third part of this equation is these requesters need to verify. So there's really three different people. The, the high-level people who are kind of setting the, the big picture of things. And then the tech people who are going to be working on it. And then the people who are going to be actually verifying this connection. So it's been my experience that single sign-on has really three different facets then, three different groups of people we'd be dealing with. We have this initial discussion, and I say, uh, you want to do single sign-on? And they say, yes. And I say, have you done it before? And they say, yes. We'll send you the metadata. Here are the attributes we need. You send us the certificate. We're done. That's pretty fast. I'm pretty happy. That, that'll be, we can probably get that, that completed in a week in QA. The next group we talk to, and I say, have you done single sign-on before? And I hear silence. A lot of silence. And then I hear crickets. 
Now, it isn't impossible for us to build, build the single sign-on, but we do have to build a little bit more time into this one because it is going to take some time. This is where we're going to be able to talk about what we typically do at Caterpillar, how we implement them, what our change windows are, the attributes that we like to send, the unique attributes, the other kinds of attributes we can send. But those are some of the discussions we have when we hear some crickets. And the third group then came to me, one of them came to me last week and said, we need to do single sign-on, but we don't even know what it is. I said, okay, here we go. So I can tell you again what our requirements are and that sort of thing. And they said, you know, Diane, in the last half an hour, we've learned everything we need to know. I thought, that's pretty good, everything you need to know in half an hour. Now, obviously, there's some more work behind it. But they had some confidence in the process because we're, we're fairly, fairly mature at, at this process uh, up to this point at any rate. Um, one of the other things that we want to do when we determine these requirements is to articulate specifically what it is. And I will tell you a little bit about our change window in a couple of minutes and how we're able to use that. But we also encourage a dedicated QA environment. We have some outfits that they're only going to do single sign-on once. They don't want to do that QA. They tell me they're doing a QA. And suddenly that becomes their production environment as well. And we really don't encourage that because if there are issues, when that certificate change comes around, anything that needs to change, and Hans alluded to this as well, there's a lot of maintenance that goes with this. Somebody changes their system, they change their uh, URLs, that sort of thing. So we want to be prepared for that and it's a little bit easier and we have a little more confidence if we're able to throw it to their QA environment as well. And the final thing that we need to do when we determine these uh, requirements is that we need to manage that verbiage you've heard all the time, we need it yesterday. Those people come in and they say, we need a single sign-on months ago. What can you do for us? We need this by the end of the week. Well, that isn't going to happen. So the, when we determine these requirements, we need to establish some um, reasonable deadlines and, and dates as to when it actually is going to go into production. The second thing that we want to do is to maintain the scheduled change window. We plan and approve the changes typically about two weeks in advance. And our change windows are at that unenviable time the second and fourth Sunday of each month between midnight and 6 a.m. And of course the reason for this is because we expect that there are fewer p users on the system at that time, and so if something breaks, there'll be fewer people who are impacted by this. Now, this is not my favorite time to be working. However, I'm going to use it to my advantage when I talk to groups because we had a group not long ago, it was actually about a year ago, and they said, well, we'd like to do the single sign-on and you can put it into production on your first change window, and then your next change window, we'd like a couple more attributes. The next change window, how about these two more and then a, little, a couple more later? And I said, well, that would be one way to do it. However, for each of those times, you're going to need, what your requester needs to verify at each of those changes because I'm not going to be there in the middle of the night making sure that it works for my side and your side both. You'll need somebody there. I heard crickets. More crickets. And then I heard the wheels start to grind. And I said, well, you know, if we did all of these, put them into QA now, tested it all out and did one production release. Oh, they thought I was a genius. So we put it in one time and we haven't touched it since then. So kind of the moral to the story is use some of these things in, in your environment and in my environment to our advantage rather than letting them kind of slip by. It prevents a lot of onesies and twosies. Um, I, one of my colleagues mentioned to me that my job was 90% talk and 10% tech. And that really is much the case of this. So it, an occasion of this that happened, though, with the change windows, we had a, a change about two weeks ago. And I think I implemented four federations at that time. And one guy I couldn't get a hold of on the Thursday of that week. So I kind of forgot about it, and I didn't contact him on Friday. So Saturday morning, he sends me an email, says, I'll be, I'll, I'll be picking up the phone on su Saturday night slash Sunday morning if there are problems. So I said, OK. Now here's the other thing I learned. If you call somebody in the middle of the night, even if they're quasi expecting you, 90% of the time they are not going to pick up that phone. So my side worked okay. His side didn't work quite right. So I called him and you know what? The guy didn't pick up the phone. So I sent him an email. So we spent about another half an hour in the middle of the night trying to get identity squared away, all this stuff ultimately, yada, yada, yada. So finally he says, okay, Monday I'll have my tech people look at it. I said, fine. Friday when I left to come to this conference, it still wasn't fixed. So even though we communicate and communicate and talk about how important it is, there's somebody available, still sometimes it kind of falls through the cracks. And that really is a, a disappointment on my side because we work pretty hard to make sure everybody is in line and knows what's going to happen. 
finally, that what you need to be able to do is to be able to say yes and no. I had someone contact me on July, July 9th for an implementation on August 1st. Now, I really, I, I'm kind of one of those people I like to please people and do the right thing and make their jobs a little easier. But at the end of the day, we just had to say no. We just simply cannot do it that quickly. We had one change window in between. So even though you want to try to, to make people's lives a little bit easier, sometimes you just have to say no. The third thing is to apply the standards that we have in place. And although this seems absolutely ridiculous at this point to say we need to apply the standards. We still sometimes have a group that says, we have this kind of homegrown thing. We'd like to do single sign with you, sign on with you. And I see some heads nodding. Yep, you've kind of seen that. So ultimately what you have to do is to say, no, this is the standard that we apply. We, we, per, we at Caterpillar um, support SAML 1.1, 2.0, and, and WSFED. So it either ha it has to be one of those three or we really can't probably do it for you right now. Um, it sounds like from the conference that there are some additional pieces of software that some companies are coming out with that maybe can help with that, and so I might recommend some of that. But ultimately, you're going to have to have some of those standards. The next thing I alluded to before is the security portion of that. And single sign-on is not just about remembering your passwords, but it is about the security mechanism that's in place. And so that has to be the most important part, the overreaching um, philosophy of all of this, applying the standards, uh, exactly what that means, and what is it for your company. The third thing is to keep your QA and prod separate. I love this story because it happened quite recently. And we had done this proof of concept for this group, and it was kind of painful. Well, the, the essence of it is we had ping on our side going to ADFS, going to WAP. We're trying to, tur to turn SAML credentials into Windows credentials. So we did the proof of concept with, again, the firewall rules, the load balancer, the whole deal. Got the proof of concept done. And so now I have these 10 new servers. And the program manager said, well, I don't understand why you need to do QA. He said, just put this into production. I said, well, there are two things wrong with this. One, when that pager goes off at 2.30 in the morning, because that's the only time the pager goes off, right, at 2.30 in the morning, I'm going to get the call. That's the first thing that's wrong with this. Secondly, when this turns into a P1 incident or priority one incident, and there's 30 people on the calls, and there's managers and people from every walks of life at our, cat at our company, the very first thing they're going to ask is, well, how does this perform in QA? And I'm going to say, oh, we didn't bother with QA. We just put this into production. You know, the guy was running out of time, so we didn't even bother with that. That is not going to fly. And I know it isn't going to fly at Caterpillar, and it isn't going to fly, I'm guessing, at most of your organizations as well. So again, sometimes you just have to say no. The idea was, I mean, we had all the servers there, and so call them QA, call them product. Doesn't, in his mind, it didn't matter. But in my mind, it matters a lot. We really have to stick with the standards here. And I can't really stress this important this this enough how important this is. And this is the communication part. We had another um, connection that they requested, and we I worked with a tech person. Works fine. Everything is we're happy with it. Happy, happy, happy. We put it into production, and he verifies it in the middle of the night. Signs off. Everybody's good. The very next Monday, his boss's boss comes in and says, we have five users who can't get on. There was a lot of hair on fire for five users, but at any rate, these five people couldn't get on. So what it turned out was that he wasn't ready for the change. We had put it in when he implemented it, even though the tech guy said, yeah, this time is fine, he wasn't quite ready for it yet. So it wasn't, we didn't have to back anything out. They made some changes on their side. But the essence of it was, even though you communicate every single day, again, 90% of my job is communication, and still sometimes something falls through the cracks. So in addition to the individual single sign-on requests, we also have those that are corporate-wide. And I can put in a, a plug for one of my colleagues here. He's implemented, he implemented the original single sign-on years ago. And it works now, much to his credit, because he was able to understand the big picture. And he was able to see maybe what we would need at this, this point, one year down the line, five years, 10 years down the line. And so I really have to credit much of, much of the success of this at this point to him as well. And he continues to be the architect, and he's giving us the right advice along the way as well. We're doing OAuth, as I mentioned, and OpenID Connect and all that sort of thing. And, and it's just his ability to understand how things work. So I'd love to tell you we have a crystal ball, and we sometimes do, but it's a little bit foggy. But we do have to ask these types of questions then. Will we have different types of users? We're a company that, like some of yours, we deal with mergers and acquisitions, and then we deal with some where we, you know, somebody else buys part of the company. So how do we deal with all of those people? How do we keep their accesses correct at all times? 
in the future, are we going to have different, uh, different accesses and be using different, different devices? So what I heard the other day was that in five years, they expect that 80% of us will be using mobile devices at work, that that will be their primary, primary way of doing that. We, if that's the case, we need to get on board with this right away and figure out how to, how to accommodate all these different devices. And ultimately, then, how do we protect our identities and our systems? So the second point, in addition to developing with intelligence and foresight, is to use vanilla when possible. Again, we don't know what's in the future. We had an occasion not long ago, well, actually, it was seven or eight years ago, when, before we had SAML, when we had some two entities put in single sign-on without using SAML, and it was kind of a homegrown thing, with the idea that when SAML came on board, we'd be able to convert it. Well, that was six or seven years, seven or eight years ago. We've had SAML. I see some, a little bit of chuckling going on here, too. Uh, we've had SAML now for six or seven years, maybe a little longer than that, and we're still living with these. So, and they aren't broken, but we just need to get them changed over. So kind of the essence of this is when you put something in, you really have to be prepared to live with it for a while, at least in our case. And so we want to be able to, to put things in that we're fairly certain we can, can continue to support for that length of time, and if we need to make changes to them, to kind of put that into the plan also. As we mentioned, we are a big company, so we have that to achieve that balance between thinking things through thoroughly and being crippled by the ability, inability to make decisions as well. I think sometimes we get bogged down in what I mentioned before, bringing the right people in. Sometimes we have too many people, sometimes too few people. So that has to be part of our plan also, is to incorporate that into our change management. Because at the end of the day, we have to get it right. And finally, when we are talking about corporate-wide SSO, again, get the right people involved at the right times and put a balance between the technical people and the technical skills and those soft skills also. Because sometimes this requires some salesmanship to make sure that everybody understands exactly what it is that you're doing and who's, who needs to be involved, what the support's going to be, what it's going to look like a few years from now. So I think I'm probably a little bit short, but is, are there some questions or some things I can elaborate on? Yes. On the uh, left side, we're talking mostly about the internal uh, headquarter applications or external. Actually, these are mostly um, uh, business partners or third party vendors. Right. Right. We put in probably uh, about 30 new connections a year. Yes. Right, right. Do you guys differentiate between that or do you call it SSO like a support, whether it's like a site minder or an access manager versus a, a federation tool? Yeah, we, we have a couple of different kinds of SSO, but this is specifically related to our ping implementation of federated SSO. I should have been more clear. No, I'm just curious because we have the same thing. Where okay. In our organization, it's right. Right, right, exactly, exactly. Yes? For your internally developed applications, are you using SAML-based SSO? And so, talk about how you support internal development. So our internal ones, we actually are moving to an, uh, an OAuth. That, that will be our, our model in the future OAuth. We have it wrapped around a, a Caterpillar proprietary system right now. Yes? We have kind of looked at that from lots of perspectives. Um, Salesforce came on board heavily, so we had several, several connections that were Salesforce related. Um, I think some groups just recognized that it was going to be, that we could do it fairly quickly and fairly easily. I think some of them had been waiting until it, it kind of, they could, they could maybe um, justify the time it would take to put them in. I think is probably part of it. Um, just the complexities of the system, it was going to be easier for us to use our single sign-on or our corporate credentials rather than whatever they were using on their side. We had one where, just recently, where, and it was an, an app that our internal people used to take a survey where the supervisor had to hand out a code to every employee in order to, for them to log in. 
So it was some of that where the lights kind of went on, I think, in a sense, and said, hey, I think we could do single sign-on with that. Let's at least look into it. So I think maybe that was part of the driver. Yes? Um, well, we have a, a single ping environment that we use for QA. Um, and I really, we, we can't control what our vendors are going to do or our, third, our business part, partners are going to do other than just suggesting to them what the benefits are of keeping a dedicated QA environment. So they, I, I do encourage them to do that because um, like with the Salesforce, they have a hundred different sandboxes that they use all the time. But part of it is just to, so that I can say, if we have an issue, and we're trying to work this out in the middle of the night in production, we could break a lot of things. So let's just keep this QA one and, and we should be able to work it out. So uh, it basically it's just to show them the benefits of keeping that QA environment. So to be clear though, you only have one QA environment. Correct. Okay. That's correct. So how many QA environments? Well, we have an architect, Roland. Um, and, and, and he does uh, he does the architecting for the whole system, and I do the single sign-on testing QA implementation. So some people would say it was a single point of failure. I would say it's a single point of su success. You know, it's semantics, I guess. Yes. You know, I can't really. I, I really can't speak to that. Roland, can you speak to that? So we have a central login server that are in the server that central login server is the So if you are a internal user with a Linux account, you have a login server that you are logging to the IDA. So you have to dedicate against our corporate code out there. And then Thanks, Roland. Yes. In our particular situation, we have um, custom adapters. So we actually would be putting those into our QA environment to test them. And our QA environment is not like some QA environments where we just test and then throw it up into production or whatever. But this is actually an environment where people can use that to access their QA application. So we actually have a 99 point something percent availability on our QA servers as well. So adapters are things that would break. Um, if we just, that's the most recent one that I can think of. We now have them clustered. We, for, for a while, we didn't have the clustered server, so we had just one. So that was an example of, of, of that. And that's typically what would break in ours, in the QA environment that would not be. I'm sorry? It really does give us some credibility when we're talking with the business partners to encourage, for instance, if they don't have a secure connection on QA, then I'm going to say, well, we're not putting it into production until you get that. So it does bring to light certain things. We can test it and we can, you know, you can show your management or whatever you want to, but at the end of the day, these are the requirements that have to that separate our QA from prod precisely.
Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It just, it, it, it's just the right thing for us to do. And I don't know about all situations, but it is the right thing for us. Yes. Sure. We're the identity provider for probably between 80 and 90 different connections now. And we're the service provider for half a dozen. Yeah. You must have a clustered environment. You just mentioned that in two ways. We do. And you just take how many service members of the cluster? Sure. So our QA environment, and again with Roland's help, our QA matches our production environment. So we have two clustered servers as well. We have one admin console and two runtime engines. And I can tell you that I breathed a huge sigh of relief when we put the production in and we had those two clustered servers rather than a single standalone server. Because if that went down, I knew that we were in some trouble. But, but this way, we at least are able to balance that. And it is behind a load balancer as well. We, we have a high availability on those servers. Yep, absolutely. And, uh, and again, I do much of the maintenance on those too. So, yes. Um, I don't really know. Roland, do you know the number of users that we might have in an hour? But virtually, so we have, just as an example, we have our healthcare site, we have a, a, our benefits sites, we have um, WebEx, we have uh, Salesforce. So you can kind of see the bulk of uh, much of our business, at least at, the, at one level, is um, federated. So anytime we open up a WebEx, however many people join that. All right, thank you very much. I appreciate your time.